My little old tug, Regina, and I nosed our way into the Port de la Concorde, but before very long I was in for a surprise. Oscar Wilde, who died here in Paris, said about the folk who went fox hunting that they were the unspeakable in pursuit of the uneatable. This young lawyer, taking the afternoon off, was catching eels for a friend. Then, to his consternation, he hooked a biggie. When the monster finally broke the surface, he said it was a carp. It must have weighed all of 30 pounds. If carp weigh more than three pounds, they are apparently uneatable. He put the fish back and it swam off, apparently none the worse for wear. There are two fountains in the Place de la Concorde, the biggest square in Paris. This beautifully restored fountain stands on the exact spot where the guillotine stood to lop off the heads of the aristocrats in the French Revolution. The fountain now represents maritime navigation. No less spectacular is what remains of the public toilet that lies by the steps of the church. Operated by the city of Paris, counters have been fixed to the mahogany doors to gratify the official hunger for statistics. In a tiny war against bureaucracy, the attendant, who is allowed to use number one, never closes the door. She's only officially used it 14 times in a year. And what do you actually sell here? All, all kitchen wares huh? and kitchen gears. Yes. And uh, we, uh, we serve all big restaurants in Paris yes. and our outside uh, in the countryside. Yes. And uh, we serve a lot of people from the uh, United States. Yes. People who are coming from schools. Yes. Or to have a uh, hobby cooker. Yes. And uh, all people who want to, to buy kitchen gear for, yes. for home or to, for professional. Uh, uh, is it very famous, this shop? Yes. yes. I mean, it's the, it's the most famous in Paris, I'm told. I think so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they should have some beautiful things here. Sure. Thank you. Stora is one of the best patisseries in Paris and has the most wonderful mural decorations. Here's the rambaba and here are the fruits of love. Retreating hurriedly before the surrounding temptations got the better of me, I made my way to the fan museum. In the quiet calm of an apartment on the third floor, Anne Hoge told me she was repairing an early 19th century fan. All the leaves are damaged, she said. I have to take them apart and start again. The language of the fan was invented by the Spanish in the 17th century, at the time of the Inquisition. That way you could flirt without being arrested. There are lots of ways of saying things, but here's one way. A folded fan touching your right cheek means follow me. On the left cheek, I'm looking for an adventure. Fan in the left hand, we're being watched. You're asking too much. Turning the fan in the right hand, I love another. Folded and pointed, do you love me? The top of the fan held by the eyes, I'm really sorry. The fan held like a mask. 
I love you. A top class strippers fan. This one's from the 19th century. This one's from the 18th century and probably the most valuable. This is a Chinese fan of justice from the end of the 19th century. The leaves were folded together one by one. When the fan is finally shut, the judge passed the sentence. Il y a les bras un par un, et une fois que l'éventail était complètement refermé, la sentence était rendue par le président du tribunal. Marie Lavorne has her shop in an arch under the old viaduct. They repair and launder valuable fabrics. It's hard to believe that you can make money these days with this kind of work, but apparently you can. Mais en ce qui concerne la maison Marie Lavande, on ne fait aucun linge de corps. Jamais. Pas être un peu historique. Ça n'a pas été fait pour être historique. On n'est pas historique quand on ne l'est pas. Donc, on fait des pièces souvent historiques. Mais c'est bien ce que je veux dire. Je veux dire que c'est bien ce I was fascinated to learn that this bedspread was made from banana fiber. She told me that the piece of lace around the edge of this handkerchief was made by hand and she was going to mount it on a newer bit of lace and restore it to its original color. This is a marriage veil or marriage shawl. The material is machine-made net and the decoration is lace made with a spindle. The motif that you see is an application of dentelle au fuseau. I wondered what these two girls were dreaming about as they worked. Lorenzo Ray is a very rare specimen. He's one of the last four people in the world who make wooden blocks for hats. The block for this hat is made from four sections of wood. His wife makes the model from a design in light canvas called crin, and then he carves the wood. The hot felt is then stretched over the block to make the hat. This type of block is called the American system. The block is dismantled from the inside when the hat is finished. The designers of haute couture fashion have some pretty outlandish ideas for hats, but somehow these people always come up with a block. They're struggling to find a way to make a block like a shell. I was delighted to find that a very high percentage of Texan Stetsons are made from the blocks carved in this workshop. By now I had understood making hats is a very specialized business. Hats are, they say, apparently making a big comeback. This little workshop is one of the most famous in Paris. They were making a series of cloche hats which looked straight out of the 1920s. Jean-Pierre Fritz, the owner, 
for professional reasons, wouldn't tell me which fashion house had ordered them. Of course, I had to ask whether the expression, mad as a hatter, went for hat makers in France as well as England. Oh yes, said Jean-Pierre. When you inhale the solution that you spread on the hat and drink a good deal of Beaujolais, which they did in the old days, it soon turns you batty. Nowadays, even though we don't drink so much, the problems the designers give us still drive us mad. He said these hats would cost about $500 each in the shops. He showed me how he steamed the felt that comes in a cone shape. He stretches the felt over a block, ties it off, trims it, and then puts it in the oven to dry. When you think about it, spending one's life making beautiful hats to adorn beautiful women is a trifle on the dotty side of life. Tucked away and just off the Grand Boulevards is Chartier's. This is my favorite kind of restaurant anywhere. The food is good, plentiful and cheap, and above all, it comes quickly, especially if you get there before it fills up. I ordered egg mayonnaise, rabbit, which was the plat du jour, and half a bottle of red wine that came in the menu price. I took one look and reckoned I'd had my money's worth. My waiter totted everything up on the tablecloth in a time-honored manner. To this day, I'm not quite sure what drew me into this shop where Zelia makes and sells exotic colored wedding dresses. Is this normal, I asked Zelia. No, she said, it's me. Then I asked her what kind of person came to her to be frocked up as brides. That was my last question because after that she never drew breath. My clientele are all the girls who detest traditional white wedding dresses. They're very independent, adventurous and emancipated. They're active professionals who've been around the world, as it were. When I arrive in certain countries, people come and touch me. Are you really Zélia, they ask? Can you really be you? I'm invited to palaces because people like my work, the way I go about things and my integrity. I won't sell to chain stores and practically all the boutiques in the world want me to work with them. New York, London, Tokyo. But those guys want to do business. But I'm a princess. I make dresses because I'm here on earth to create beauty. And I believe artists are here to enrich the people. Businessmen say I could be rich. But I say if I wanted to be rich, I'd marry a rich man. Because I find it a lot less complicated than working to get rich. The prices range from $450 to $950. However, that includes everything, the petticoats, the skirt, the veil, the handbag. Uh, 
In fact, I offer everything that's needed except the husband. I like to have a hand in the choice of all the accessories, like the shoes and the bouquet, because often the brides arrive in a town where they don't know the florist. You can take off the hood. If you're hot, you can take off the sleeves. And after that, you can take off the skirt and go on till you're naked. I work a lot with prints, which I mix with cotton, silks and cretons. Alors évidemment, tout ça, ça fait des, des thèmes. Alors là, I par exemple, la Margie Pirate, Here, for example, is a pirate dress with little panties and pictures that match. Les bateaux. Alors effectivement, il faut qu'il y ait un cadre qui corresponde. Les and here's a Lolita avec des mélanges de, de Vichy, petits carreaux, grands carreaux, mélangés toujours avec des gros piquets de coton. Alors tout ça, ce sont des matières qui étaient These pas très connues euh, dans la mariée, mais qui weddings, permettent d'amener un petit peu de spice de, de, de piment euh, et d'odeur et de vie aux, aux toilettes. This outfit gives a nice fresh feeling for elegant girls. We make them in mauve, orange and yellow. Here's the veil, which gives the outfit the wedding look. With all the bits and pieces, it makes for a nice fresh bride. Et puis, finalement, C'est presque comme une mariée puisqu'on a quand même le voile, on a du blanc, on a le petit sac, le petit bouquet et euh, ça fait des mariées très fraîches. Je te laisse te tourner pour montrer un petit peu le, le dos. Alors toujours avec le petit lassage, euh, dans le dos, nip at the waist, les petites basses, and the skirt is all soft, et, euh, sans fluid and comfortable. Sans baleine, tout est mou, donc c'est hyper euh, confortable. À la mer de la famille, c'est the oldest grocery shop in Paris. It's the temple of old-fashioned shopping elegance. It survives these days by making temptations for the hardcore gourmets of Paris. This family bought the shop in 1961, I was told. They sell mostly chocolates here, which they make in the back room and at a workshop tucked away behind the building. They also sell sweets from all over France. What exactly do you do here? What do you sell? Oh, here we sell old perfume bottles, old toilet sets and all the uh, bottles and boxes uh, that have a connection with the perfume and the luxury from 19th century until I would say 19, 1940 because we restore the old atomizers and you have this magnificent uh, noise sound of the, of the perfume when, it, when it's sprayed and it's also a magic uh, attitude. Perfume, what they call eau de parfum, uh, because it's not so strong. Uh, before, uh, before 1940, 1930, there were more perfume, real, what we call real perfume, le parfum, oui. in French, that was what you call extract. Mm. That was very strong and uh, very expensive. As in, as in, um, uh, the young girls and the women then after, mm. women knew how to use the perfume. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure they have the same education now, so you can sometimes smell perfume very strong early in the morning, that is not recommended mm. at all. And they also have to, to make a good connection between their personality and the perfume they use that they are young, that they are blonde, they are brown, they are different uh, type of complexion and things like that. I visited another old family business in the heart of Paris. 
We've been making curved glass now for four generations. My son will make it the fifth generation. What exactly is Ver Bombay, I asked. It's a process that consists of an 18th century wood furnace, or indeed a more modern furnace. It's a means of transforming flat glass with heat into various shapes. We make a mould and the glass, when it plastifies, sinks into the mould. We move the mould about with a special tool called a maranga, taking care not to mark the glass. À l'intérieur du, du moule, on parfait les cintres et les bandes avec un outil, comme vous l'avez vu, qui se nomme un ringard. On écarte à la soufflette les braises pour ne pas qu'elles viennent trop marquer le verre comme il faisait dans le temps. We produce the glass in the way they did in the 19th century for repairing lanterns of the period. This is a genuine 18th century lantern which has been gilded with a mercury process. I'm repairing it exactly as it would have been in the 18th century. In the 18th century, they made all the lanterns precisely for the place they were going to put them. All the perspectives for the lamps match the pillars, etc. My job allows me to come in contact with extremely rare objects, which are often very beautiful. Over the years, we've developed a culture, thanks to all the conservationists and our interest in our jobs, that allows us to restore objects in the true spirit of the period. Ce qu'il faut faire pour remettre l'objet que l'on que l'on a en réparation dans le goût et dans le jus de l'époque, comme l'on dit en français. Nestling at the foot of the Sacré Cœur in Montmartre is the Angel Shop. I asked the woman who owns it how she'd happened on this idea. It was from one day to the next. I stopped what I was doing with antiques for angels. It was a choice without me knowing it that enabled me to choose the people I wanted to know. Because I found that in each line of business you meet like-minded people. For instance, a doctor meets people with medical problems, a grocer is the same. With angels, all kinds of people turn up, but they are a world of nice people. But the majority are women. Whether they are French or German, they are always the same kind of woman. Women who are soft and happy and who are not bothered by competition. Serene, in fact. Monsieur Perrin is a famous, if irascible, maker of stringed instruments of all sorts. Perrin, with a handful of signposts, which come from Switzerland, checks a few details with his daughter. I arrived one afternoon when he was hurriedly putting the finishing touches to a valuable antique cello, which was being picked up later. It's a Guillaume, he said, worth about $30,000. Like all masters of their craft, Monsieur Perrin went about setting up the cello with a certain panache, a lick here, a whittle there, and the job, after a lifetime of experience, was soon done. It always amazes me when I watch people like this adjusting something like the bridge on a cello, how quickly they can do it. His cellist friend came to tune it up nicely. Musicians are different from the rest of us. Donc, euh, à la semaine prochaine. 
In another quiet Parisian courtyard, I came across Monsieur Girard and his wife. Mr. and Mrs. Girard deal with the symbols of power. Hotel porters, generals, admirals, they're all the same to them. Nowadays, since no one can park to shop, many shops have behatted men with smart caps with the firm's name on them, ready to park their cars. But all occupations have their pitfalls. Mrs. Girard told me of an embroidered hat they'd made which had been rejected because it had one too many gold leaves in the embroidery. The committee had changed the number of leaves without telling the Girards. The gentleman in the tie had just been appointed as chief of police in New Caledonia, a vast but remote French province in the Pacific. He'd come to collect his hat, his badge of office. Fully equipped, the new chief of police left for the South Pacific and the Regina and I left for the South of France.